Cash for Clunkers was a federal program where people traded in their gas-guzzling 80s and 90s vehicles for more modern, more fuel-efficient offerings. It was supposed to not only reduce emissions, but also boost the U.S. auto industry after the 2008 economic crash. In the five months that the program was active, over 670,000 used cars and trucks were destroyed. I'm talking revved to death and then crushed for scrap. But how many of those were crusty old commuters, and how many were real enthusiast gems? Well, I've got the full list right here. We've gone deeper into this data than anyone before, finding the most egregious trade-ins and most memorable casualties. I've read through this entire thing, and my pain is about to become your pain. Figuring out exactly what we lost in cash for clunkers feels more important than ever as consumers are being pushed towards EVs. I mean, states like Colorado and Vermont have already brought back the idea. Because the thing is, it didn't really do what it was supposed to. In fact, it might have made the market worse. If you don't already know cash for clunkers, or rather the car allowance rebate system, it was a federal trade-in program that offered sellers vouchers towards purchasing a new vehicle based on how fuel efficient the new car was and how fuel efficient the old car wasn't. The maximum offering was $4,500, which spent a bit like $6,600 today. That might seem like a good deal if you're sitting there in 2008 with your Dodge Diplomat getting 12 miles a gallon and you just want one of those new Priuses that all the celebrities seem to be driving. But it's not only sad sedans on this list. Imagine trading an A80 Toyota Supra for $4,500 towards a new Toyota Venza. Are you serious? And if you think that's an example I just made up, you might want to brace yourself. Let's start with Audi. Uh, two 1985 Audi Quattros, the rally legend itself. I'm sorry to hit you hard with that right out the gate, but that actually happens. You've got a 2001 Audi S4 Avant. Two of those, sorry, two 2001 S4 Avants that someone traded in. A 1995 Audi S6 Avant, the five cylinder, that was traded in for a 2009 RAV4. Wanna understand, but it's really hard sometimes. BMW, this will sound ridiculous, but literally hundreds of BMW E30s were scrapped in this program. Of all trims, you've got 325i, 325iX, you've got some convertibles, you've got a 1991 BMW M3. Yeah, that was actually traded in for a Toyota Prius. And if that is surprising, well, it should be because pff, that's just crazy to think about today. But actually this program accounted for 10% of Prius sales in 2009 as a result of people trading in whatever they had and running off with a brand new Prius. Geez, okay, is this all German cars? You're wondering where all these 80s and 90s German cars went. A lot of them ended up here. 530i Touring, 520i Touring, 540i's on this list. Oh my God, there's an E39, like the best sedan ever made. But if you're thinking that, okay, these are old German luxury cars, they probably didn't work anymore and people were happy to get rid of them for 4,500 bucks. It's not quite true because the program required that a car had to be in running condition, insured and registered for a year prior to the sale. So these were functional vehicles. These were not lawn ornaments. These were working cars that maybe they were in crappy condition. Maybe they were, you know, sort of mechanically falling apart, but they still worked. And today you can't imagine just like giving away a running E34. It just, it just wouldn't happen. Okay, there is also a 1991 M5. Someone traded that for a Honda Civic automatic transmission. Moving on to Mercedes, there are hundreds of W124s, the, you know, the Proto E-Class from the 80s. Those things run forever. They pick up 500,000 miles as taxis around the world without even breaking a sweat. So you know some of these could have lived a much longer life. There are wagons, there are coupes, there are sedans. There's even, and I'm not making this up, a 1992 Mercedes 500E, which is the super sedan that Porsche co-developed. Someone also traded that for a Prius. Then you have 141 190E 2.6s, the Proto C-Class, that compact sedan with an inline six. That was a really, really strong run, a really smooth car. Then you have the W126 S-Class. That was the one built from 79 to 91. Really like one of the last over-engineered uh, craftsmanship first S-Classes. 
Hundreds of those are on this list too. And I'm talking, we've got the 500, the 560 SEL, the 560 SEC, which is that beautiful pillarless coupe. Honestly, one of the best designs from the 80s period. Now, who doesn't love a Mercedes V12? Well, apparently three people who traded it in their S600s. Those were traded for a Honda Odyssey, a Toyota Camry, and again, a Toyota Prius, respectively. All right, so there was a lot of American cars on this list, which is no surprise, right? Like a lot of inefficient American cars made in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and especially something like Buick, which... Bruh. Even in the 90s and 80s though, they were making some pretty cool cars. And one of my personal favorite cars of all time, it's gonna sound strange, but it's the mid 90s Buick Roadmaster, the B-Body Special. I mean, it's just so elegant and stately. And it was like the last gasp of that body on frame, rear wheel drive American sedan. Hundreds of them, hundreds of them met their fate. And then hundreds more of the wagon version, which nowadays, you know, with the wood panel side, the sky view roof, the LT1 engine, those things are actually very collectible now. I mean, a couple of years ago, they landed on Haggerty's list of future collectibles. And yeah, let's see, two, three, four, almost over 800 of those gone in this program. Oh, there's a 1992 GMC Typhoon on here. One of less than 5,000 ever made. One of the weirdest things on this list is the Ford Taurus show. You can imagine a lot of these people might have gotten upsold. They walked into a dealership looking for a regular Ford Taurus. The salesman starts throwing around phrases like super high output. And suddenly they're driving off the lot in a show. All 677,000 vehicles were sent to their final death brave little toaster style. The program stipulated that every vehicle traded in had to have its motor permanently disabled before it could be crushed and sold for scrap. That meant scrappers were literally blowing up engines before they could be crushed. So junkyards and dealers were instructed to drain the engines of their oil, replace that with a sodium silicate solution that would harden with the heat, and then literally bounce the engine off the rev limiter until the whole thing seized up. Some took a few minutes. Some clung to life for hours. But at least some of the guys working in the yard had a little bit of fun with them as one last ride. So a quick note, there have been other reports about this in the past, especially back in 2009 when everything was just chaos as all these cars were getting traded in. One example that came up constantly of a vehicle that should not have been destroyed was a Buick GNX. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Now this is a full audited list. This is the most complete one that you can get and it has been gone over with a fine tooth comb by the government. There's no GNX on here. So either it never happened or someone managed to slip it out of the junkyard and save it from the official record. But either way, let's just pretend that that one got away and is living its best life somewhere out there in the world. But there was also a 1989 Pontiac Trans Am 20th anniversary edition that too had the same turbo V6. So equal crime. <laughs> So this program was clearly not designed with a car enthusiast like you or me in mind. But in terms of the economy, emissions, and the average consumer, did it actually work? Data is a bit hazy depending on who's reporting it, but on the whole, no. Of course there was a huge spike in new vehicle sales, and units sold over the next year were higher than projections before cash for clunkers. But total sale revenue was actually lower, because the most fuel efficient vehicles also tend to be the cheapest. Fewer people were spending money on luxury cars or big trucks they didn't need, and that meant fewer dollars spent per vehicle sold. There's also a lot of evidence that it really wrecked the used car market by destroying a lot of vehicles, running and driving vehicles, that would have sold for under $4,000. And in terms of the environment, greenhouse gas emissions attributed to U.S. transportation peaked in 2007. So cash for clunkers may have had a temporary positive effect but so did a dozen other programs and advancements in technology since then. A study from the University of Michigan found that the CARS program prevented 4.4 million tons of CO2 emissions, which sounds impressive until you realize that's about 0.4% of US annual light duty vehicle emissions, or in other words, a drop in the bucket, globally speaking. Not only that, but the surge in SUV sales last decade pretty much erased any lasting benefits. One of the things that really struck me about this list is just how many classic 80s and 90s trucks, things that are really popular today, 
are on here. I'm talking thousands of Jeep Wranglers, thousands of XJ Cherokees, hundreds of first gen Toyota 4Runners, almost 600 80 series Land Cruisers. Now, as you can see behind me, 1988 K5 Blazer, that's my pride and joy right there. I'm just gonna pretend that uh, none of those got destroyed. If I could have picked over the 495 K5 Blazers, my life would be a lot easier. I mean, it's really hard to find interior parts for this thing now as it is. And speaking of that, I mean, some of these cars, single individual parts are worth hundreds of dollars these days. And you can imagine the value. It's just crazy how these things have appreciated. I mean, you have to remember, this was the beginning of the crossover boom. People didn't want these big, ungainly, blocky SUVs. People wanted smooth and fluid and comfortable, but that doesn't make it hurt any less when you look at something like a 1991 Jimmy with a 6.2 diesel traded in for a, a Nissan Rogue with a CVT. I mean, that is the trade people were looking to make back then. Now, I know I said it was 80s and 90s cars on this list, but there are actually quite a few 2000s vehicles on here. Remember, this was in 2009, and there were people who lost a lot of money in the recession. They might have been trading in cars or trucks that were new enough to have warranties. There were 17 cars on this list from the 2008 model year, one year before. Two Ford Explorers, an F-150, even a Saab 9.3 Aero. Less than two years old. So we haven't talked a lot about Japanese cars yet on this list, and that's because a lot of them are relatively fuel efficient. I mean, you're not gonna find a Honda Civic or a Toyota Corolla on here. But what you will find is a 1992 Mazda RX-7 FD manual turbo rotary that someone traded in for a Toyota Corolla. Well, not as painful, but still kind of painful. There's a 2005 Mazda RX-8 on this list, which, okay, wow. There are well over a hundred uh, Mitsubishi 3000 GTs, both the GTs and the Spiders. There's also the Toyota Supra, right? I mentioned at the beginning. Now we don't know if that was the naturally aspirated 2J or the turbo, but I think we can bet that it wasn't the naturally aspirated version because that was actually good enough on fuel to not qualify for this program. So let's see what else. A bunch of Nissan 300ZXs. There are like no Hondas on this list at all. Oh, there's the Honda Passport, the original one of the, re the rebadged uh, Zuzu Trooper. Yeah, you can imagine that one was inefficient enough. Oh, here's a good one. Well, it depends on your definition of good, but let's go with it. So, Infinity. We all know they have their problems today. They don't like any good cars anymore. The whole Carlos Ghosn thing. Their first car, though, the Q45, launched in 1989. That was a hell of a vehicle. I mean, it was a performance luxury sedan. So tech forward, full active suspension for the time. I mean, come on. That was honestly probably the peak of Infinity. And hundreds of them gone in cash for clunkers. Oh, well, actually over a thousand it looks like. Something else I noticed on this list is that there are no WRXs or Lancer Evos on either side. No one traded them in and no one bought one in exchange for an older car. It's like they were in this weird middle ground where they were too fuel efficient to qualify for a trade-in, but not fuel efficient enough for you to get a voucher for one. But some cool cars were actually fuel efficient enough to qualify for a voucher. Not everyone came out the other side of this with a Prius. Some people actually traded up to something much better than they had before. A few examples. A 1997 Ford Explorer V6. Someone swapped that for a 2009 Golf GTI. Manual, too. Someone traded a 1992 GMC Safari for an NC Miata manual. I know the NC is not everyone's cup of tea, but under these circumstances, that's a win. Someone swapped a 1994 Dodge Ram van for a Pontiac Solstice. That sounds like a midlife crisis. Not fun to have one of those right after a financial crisis. But again, good call. 2009 was also around the time that OBD2 entered the picture. And so a lot of cars were entering a new generation at that time that was a little bit more efficient. So you actually have some people trading in something like a 1991 Ford F-150 for a 2009 Ford F-150. There's also some truly weird stuff traded in. Take the Excalibur Phaeton, which if you don't know what that looks like, it's this. 
It's a remake of a 1928 Mercedes SSK on a Studebaker platform with a Chevy small block. Because it's so rare, that car's worth over $40,000 right now. Then you've got three LaForzas. Again, if you're not familiar with LaForza, don't blame you. It was one of the first luxury SUVs before that was really a thing. Italian craftsmanship Ford V8. They barely sold any of them. Three of them bit the dust here. Then you've got 18 Merker XR4TIs. You know, the Ford Sierra they brought over from Europe in the late 80s, the cool double spoiler. They're really hard to find today, that much harder after this. The top three most common vehicles purchased with Cash for Clunkers money were the Toyota Corolla, the Honda Civic, and the Toyota Camry. And the three most commonly traded in vehicles were the Ford Explorer, the Dodge minivans, and the Jeep Grand Cherokee. People were really downsizing to fit their new realities, and this is something we often forget when we're looking at these lists. The 2008 crash was America's worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Just 15 years ago, cars we look at today as these rare classics, they were almost impossible to even give away on the open market. I should have jumped on this when I had the chance. Looking at this list, we know how crazy it would be right now in 2024 to scrap some of these classics. But at the same time, it's hard to deny how similar the situation was in 2009 to today. The economy sucks, gas is expensive, inflation's out of control, and governments around the world are calling for lower emissions. If a similar nationwide program popped up paying people to swap Silverados for Rivians or Mustangs for Ionics, how many Americans do you think would take that deal? Used cars are already too expensive. Just wait and see what would happen if the government scraps another 600,000 of them. And if Cash for Clunkers Part 2 does come to pass, my advice, get ahead of it. Buy whatever you can. I know I'll be knocking on doors with cash in hand. We're a couple months into relaunching the channel and we're really loving the reception it's been getting so far. Everyone's been digging charisma, but there's no point in doing this if we're not making stuff that you want to watch. So. We're still tinkering with the formats, what these videos look like, but what you tell us now will actively shape where all this is going. So don't hold back. Thanks for watching.